Perichoresis and the Trinity. Today we are jumping into the deeper end. My name is Al Persson. You can contact me at pastor at mascot.church or in the comments below if they're published by the time when I publish this video. Don't always turn the comments on immediately, but I should. I hope you're all well. Let's pop into this subject today. We are on the verge of closing off our general study of the Trinity. We're using the Athanasian Creed as a template. And what we're doing is, as we're approaching new elements in our study, we're changing the color of them to uh, from white to blue to red. And we're going to follow that on today. Perichoresis. It's, uh, the original meaning of the word is to dance together. And it's a phrase or a word that's been, that's been put together to talk about the relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in the Trinity. But the word also has, uh, has found itself into, in other places, which has to do with uh, uh, oneness and unity of people uh, or people in the presence of God, God in his people, and so on. We're going to limit our look today at perichoresis in the Trinity. There's a... Uh, a, a, a large body of work, and it's out there if you do searches on the internet or on theological websites or whatever. But um, this perichoresis in the Trinity is not really very well, not very easy to find. I'm going to give you a good start on this topic and get you thinking about it today. So, we are continuing our discussion of the doctrine of the Trinity. I'd like to start with uh, the reference, the definition again that we're working off from Dr. James White. This is uh, within the one being that is God, there exists eternally three co-equal and co-eternal persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You already have the sense of perichoresis in that particular passage that within the one being exists three persons, uh, co-eternal, etc. Now, to help you get on a good footing, I need to, I'd like to remind you that our existence is in at least two realms. We cannot exist in time alone, we cannot exist in space alone, and we cannot exist above space and time or without space and time. God exists without space and time. The question of how God operates in time is a difficult one, and the best minds in the world are still tangling with that. I'm not going to do too much. We might do a video in the future that talks about uh, the, some of the challenges in understanding it, but I don't think so. But just remember, our existence is bound to these, at least these two realms. And time has to be uh, a certain type of time. And space certainly has to be a certain type of space. It can't be too hot, can't be too cold, has to have various elements in it in order for us to exist. Anyways, let's look at some scriptures that deal with God dwelling in another person one member of the Godhood dwelling in the member of another, another of the Godhood, Godhead, etc. One member of the Godhead indwelling another member of the Godhead, and so on. I think you know what I'm talking about when I get to these passages. Here we go, Colossians 2.9. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Okay, so uh, the fullness of God dwells in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have one member of the Godhead in dwelling an other. Here's another a slightly different passage about a different topic. Or do you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, you are not your own? The scripture talks in several places about the Spirit of God in dwelling people, in dwelling people. The Lord Jesus Christ, before his crucifixion, teaching his disciples, made this statement. Believe in me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Very strong Trinitarian passage here. Jesus is in the Father, and the Father is in him. Okay, so this interdwelling of the two members of the, of two of the members of the Trinity, of the Godhead. Okay, uh, John 17, Jesus is now praying. He's talking to his heavenly Father in John 17. That's a good prayer by the, they're all great prayers, but it's really worth reading this one uh, if, you're, if you need a bit of a, an, uplifting, an uplift in your daily walk. 
I do not ask for these only, the Lord prays, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So there's an element of perichoresis between the Father and the Son here, but there's also a sense of God wanting to be in his people and his people needing to be in God, interdwelling. You kind of get this going on now. You heard me say earlier that the doctrine of perichoresis, or that the word is used and applied to various elements of, of inness, if you will. Hey, that's a good word. But we really want to center up purely or mostly on the doctrine of the Trinity being in God, in Christ. And there's a lot that we could do here. So I'm going to try to keep this really well focused as we head on. Now, uh, here's an interesting passage that uses this whole uh, perichoretic sense with the people of God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You see here the members of the Godhead being with and indwelling the people of God. Now we have also, uh, as we push this a little bit farther, we have elements of the uh, members of the Godhead revealing God to us, opening up this whole sense of perichoresis where our own relationship is concerned. So again, we just want to highlight, we're talking about the Trinitarian view of, the Trinitarian, uh, not view, but the Trinitarian doctrine of perichoresis, but we're overlapping a little until I get more focused in the next several videos. When Jesus was on earth in his earthly ministry, he referred to the Father as Abba, which is an Aramaic word. There's nothing really like it in English. That's why most Bible translations leave it in there as it is. Here is the, um, uh, the place in Mark 14 I'm talking about. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. The word Abba and Father is the same word here. The translators left it in more than likely to indicate the uh, the failure of our language to accurately demonstrate this concept. When the Holy Spirit indwells the life of the believer, the believer begins to cry out. You begin to cry out for the Father as well. And you get that cry from the Holy Spirit, who also cries, Abba, Father. Look at this. But you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. What does the Holy Spirit do? He causes us to cry out to the Father, Abba, Father, Daddy, this sense of oneness with God that is there once we are forgiven of our sins. This, it's a kind of a perichoretic sense. Remember, our word is perichoresis for the day. And because you are sons, it says in Galatians 4, 6, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we've looked at some passages which uh, have to do with God's people and uh, some interactions. It's a little bit, been a little bit fuzzy. We're now going to much more closely examine the perichoretic nature in the Trinity itself. Now, sometimes people say, well, Al, you use big words. Why do you use words like, perichoresis. Why do you have to do that? Well, because a word like perichoresis saves me having to use a bunch of other words. Think about the word Bible. The word Bible is not in the Bible, but I could call it God's inspired writings via his prophets. That's a lot of words. I could call it the 66 books that Christians use. That's also a lot of words. By shorthand to get to Bible, well, we understand what goes on. And so uh, perichoresis is kind of a shorthand for God's, the interpenetration of all the members of the Godhead, one with another. See how many words I had to use there? One word, perichoresis, covers it. Most of the people who complain to me about the use of big words are native English speakers. That's odd. People who have English as a second language very seldom complain about that. They like to learn new words. Very, very curious. I wonder if it's the same with other languages as well but it's a thing that I've noticed over the years. Okay, so let's just pop in, and we're going to see that each member of the Godhead raised Jesus from the dead. How is that going to be possible? Well, let's have a look. Jesus answered, speaking of his body, you can read that in John 2, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Here Jesus is talking about the fact that he will raise up his body. Okay, 
Let's go on to the next passage here that we're looking at, Acts 3.15. Peter is preaching. And Peter is talking about, uh, and he says this, And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. Okay, so Jesus Christ is the author of life, the creator of all things we've seen in the past. And who raised him from the dead? God raised him from the dead. So Jesus raised himself from the dead. God raised him from the dead. Well, does the Bible say the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead? Well, yes, it does. Romans 8, 11. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give, give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Wow. There's a lot in that passage. There's a lot in that passage. It actually talks about uh, uh, the Holy Spirit raising Christ from the dead. So who raised Christ from the dead? God raised Christ from the dead. Well, yes, the Father raised Christ from the dead, the Son raised himself from the dead, and the Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead. You see three members of the Godhead as individual persons operating as one God. Three in one, one essence, three persons. Possibly a little light is turning on with some of you in the audience who are trying to get your head around the three in one. Think about those passages. We want to go a little bit farther and look at the whole concept of occupying the same space. I have on my desk, now in my hand, three pens. This pen normally sits in this jacket here, these two on my desk. No matter how closely I push these three pens together, they never occupy the same space. Even if I put them in a press and mash them all up, or put them in a blender and mash them all up, they would never really occupy the same space. The molecules that came from this pen would be different from this one and this. You may not, as a human being, be able to, but this is actually a pencil, <laughs> and you may not be able to separate these out, but they never occupy the same space. No matter how close you are to a friend, to a child, to uh, whoever, you never occupy the same space as them. You hold your, your uh, precious loved one close, you cannot occupy the same space. You sit in a chair, you occupy some space, the chair occupies other space, you don't actually occupy the same. Do I need to say that again? I don't think so. I think you've got it. Well, what about members of the Trinity? How is God able to do it? Well, by the way, how is God able to live inside? How can the Father live in the Son and the Son live in me? How, 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 how? Aha. Remember we said that God is incomprehensible. We're going to deal with this. In order for God to be, uh, to, well, God, a being who can occupy the same space as another being would really be incomprehensible to us. This is a passage where, or a statement we have really dealt with in our Athanasian Creed summaries, but you really can see this now. Okay, let's have a look at uh, some scriptures that talk about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit occupying the same space. Jeremiah 23, Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. So God speaks of himself as filling heaven and earth. In our doctrine of God, we talked about the omnipresence of God. Remember, we talked about the omniscience, omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence of God. God is everywhere. So we have the Father being everywhere. This could be a reference to the Son, could also be a reference to the Father, but let's go on. There's no issue here in the next passage. Psalm 139. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. As the Holy Spirit inspired the scriptures, what is he saying? There's no way you can escape. You cannot go anywhere where I am not. If there is somewhere where God is not, God is not God. Hey, I like that. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. The Father is everywhere. You know, we don't even really have to go to everywhere. All we have to do is be able to say, are, can you be in more than one place at one time? Think about that. What does the scripture say about the Son in Hebrews chapter 13? Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. 
What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God? Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's go to the top. I will never leave you or forsake you. Who said that? The Son. The passage actually talks about the fact that the Son is the same yesterday and forever, today and forever down below. So in these three, and there are many passages that talk about this all the way through Scripture, and that some indicate it, some indicate it indirectly. In these three passages, we have the Father being everywhere, omnipresent, the Spirit being everywhere, or at least in more than one place at one time, omnipresent, and the Son being able to be with His people everywhere in all times, at least being able to be in more than one place at one time. And really all you'd have to do to be a creature above anything, to be a being above anything in creation is to be able to be in two places at the same time. That, that would be it. No created being can do that. God, however, is everywhere. So how does this work? If the Son is infinite and the Spirit is infinite and the Father is infinite, which we contend that they are, if they're omnipresent, well, does the Father say to the Holy Spirit, well, get out of my way, this is just my territory? And the Son say, no, no, this is mine. How can you have three infinites that each occupy a limited space? They wouldn't be infinite. I hope you're getting this. In order for God to be infinite, and the Father to be infinite, the Son to be infinite, and the Spirit to be infinite, they have to occupy each other's space. Perichoresis. Dance together. They must interpenetrate each other fully. They occupy each other's space completely. Possibly some of you who have thought this through and are watching this, and over time will watch it, have considered that the doctrine of perichoresis should be the last in a series in the doctrine of the Trinity. It would be the, the pinnacle, the last doc doctrine you'd ever teach and you could build up to it. I considered that, but I thought, no, this is probably a pretty fair place to start given the audience that we have today and that we could have in the future, and also my ability to communicate it. If we look at the perichoretic elements that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are, they co-occupy each other's space. That's, they occupy each other's space, co-occupy. I don't think that's very good. We immediately have a sense of the incomprehensibility of God. We're reminded again of his infinity. We start being able to see the three persons and the one, the, the three members, the three persons and the one essence. All these things start to begin to make a lot more sense. When we also see that the three members of the Trinity each perform the same task, that is the raising of Christ from the dead, yet there is a separate Father, separate Son, separate Spirit, three separate persons, we get the sense of, okay, three separate persons, one God occupying the same space. Perichoresis. What a great, wonderful word. Now, our approach here has been to use the Athanasian Creed and to mark off elements in the Athanasian Creed as read once we have dealt with them. The elements that we are dealing with on the day are in blue. So the next time you see the blue non-italicized items in the Athanasian Creed, it will be because we are marking them off after today. So let's go through really quickly and have a look at those as we wrap this up today. Our framework for what we're doing is the Athanasian Creed. It steps through and marks the doctrine of the Trinity quite well. Anything that's in white is something we've not yet dealt with. Remember that the Catholic faith is the faith that all Christians hold. There are some Roman Catholics who are, uh, who are part of Christianity, but all Christians are Catholic. Roman Catholic Church holds its allegiance through Rome, but all Christians are members of the Catholic faith. So it's a word that's kind of fallen out of use here. Anyways, down below you can see the glory in blue, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal, such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Ghost. These are going to be in red next week. We have looked at, or maybe italicized, because we want to talk about the majesty and the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I'll make a call this week about that. Let's go on to our next slide. The top section is going to be in red next week. Yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal, as also there are not three incomprehensibles, nor three uncreated, but one uncreated and one incomprehensible. 
I think you can see that pretty clearly from the fact that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit all raised Jesus from the dead. They also all occupy the same space, co-eternal. Yep. Understandable? Nope. <laughs> Incomprehensible. We get a kind of a picture. Because you see, we, we have to occupy space and time. We, we, we don't grasp easily something that does not occupy space and time like we do. Down below in the middle section, yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. I think that's pretty clear from our discussion today. And down in italics below, I want to deal with this a little bit better. It says, yet there are not three gods, but one God. So likewise, the Father is Lord, the Son Lord, and the Holy Ghost Lord. Yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. For like as we are compelled by the, by the Christian verity to acknowledge every person by himself to be both God and Lord, we are forbidden by the Catholic faith to say there are three gods or three lords. So I'm going to spend a bit more time on that. I think that'll be the last one. It's in italics because we hit on it virtually at every session uh, now as we're completing this study. On the next slide, and in this trinity there is, in this trinity none is a for or other or after other, none is greater or less than another, but the whole three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal. Probably that will go red next week. We might make some more comments. And this last slide here, furthermore, it's necessary to everlasting salvation that he also rightly believe the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. In order to be saved from our sins, we have to understand the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, at least have a picture that the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth, took on human form, died for our sins. Maybe the moment you come to Christ, you fall on your knees and ask him to forgive your sins, you may not fully grasp that. But, the, but true Christianity uh, entails that and holds all of that in its view, in its, in its body of belief. So today we've looked at the perichoresis, doctrine of perichoresis and the Trinity. The fact that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit occupy the same space. We noted today that human beings must exist in space and time, and that you, no matter how much you love or care for someone, cannot occupy the same space as that person. You don't occupy the same space as anything. I don't occupy the same space as the clothes that I'm wearing. I looked at the, at the pencil and the, two, and the two pens and said no matter how much I mash these together, they never occupy the same space. They're reasonably comprehensible. I can reasonably understand it. Imagine if I had two pens that somehow could still remain pens but occupy the same space as each other. That would be, with our knowledge, incomprehensible. We could not understand that. What sets the doctrine of the Trinity apart here is this element of incomprehensible, incomprehensibility. The Father and the Son and the Spirit, all being eternal, all being God, all being loving, all being intensely personal, all having different roles in terms of our relationship with them, being co-equal, occupying the same space, yet still being God, still being personal. As we go on further, we're going to have a look at how this all wraps up into our own personal lives, into our daily worship experience, and so on. The Athanasian Creed begins with the fact that we worship uh, the Trinity in unity and unity in the Trinity. Well, we'll look at that as well. Okay, so today we've looked at perichoresis and the Trinity. I hope to do a little more detailed work on this, probably in writing, maybe not in a video coming up. My name is Al Person. You can contact me at pastor at mascot dot church or in the comments below. God bless. We'll see you in our next study.